Thank you. It is 7 o'clock. It's clear from the turnout tonight that we like the rain. <laughs> I'd like to make a couple of opening comments, uh, particularly if there is any voter tonight who was unable to participate last night. I will be brief. So again, we have a quorum and we have been called to order. The town clerk read the call of the meeting last night. That need not happen again tonight. I do draw to your attention, of course, that there are warrant booklets in the room. If you did not have an opportunity to get one, they are in the back of the room. There's also the supplemental report of advisory, which is quite brief and relates only to Article 17. There is also the report of the planning board. We have a number of land use issues that we will address tonight, uh, as we do each year in the case of any standing votes uh, or other counted votes. We have citizens of the town who have been appointed as tellers for that purpose. As is our tradition, I've admitted to the meeting a number of guests. They are in the guest section to my right, to your left. We're pleased to have them with us. They, of course, are not allowed to vote on any matter that comes before the meeting. And if a guest wishes to address the meeting, he or she will need the permission of the meeting to address the meeting. That permission is granted by way of a majority vote, which while I would invite such a vote at the appropriate time. Again, on behalf of all citizens, I thank our colleagues at Harbor Media for providing closed circuit television coverage for this meeting. The meeting is being recorded for subsequent broadcast on the local access cable channels. There is, of course, no smoking permitted anywhere in the building. I ask that you take this moment, which I'm about to do, to turn off cell phones. And please refrain from using your phone or from sending or receiving any text messages absent an absolute emergency or a compelling reason. Using phones and texting is a distraction from the serious business before this meeting. The election um, details are set forth in your warrant booklet that will take place on Saturday. The precincts are all laid out in the book. The hours for voting are from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m and you can vote in advance of the 27th if it's not convenient for you to vote at that time. On that day, you can go to the town clerk's office during its regular business hours up until Friday at noon. After Friday noon, you cannot any longer vote at the town clerk's office, but until then, you can do so. In addition, I just remind folks who vote here at the high school, which is precincts one, two, three, and four, that the access is via the side entrance to the gym and not off Union Street. In the unlikely event of an emergency and a need to evacuate the building, please follow the instructions of the uniformed police and fire personnel. They will direct you to the most appropriate exit and where to assemble once you are safely outside the building. Next, I call your attention to the Talent Bank application form. It's at the end of the warrant booklet at page 94. The selectmen and the moderator always welcome volunteers for service on the many appointed town committees and boards. If you are interested, and I urge you to consider becoming interested, Please fill out the Talent Bank application and drop it either in the box that is marked Talent Bank Applications here in the hall, or simply return it to the Selectman's office at any time. The Talent Bank application form can also be found readily on the town's website, can be completed and returned electronically. The Selectman and the moderator will meet with those who wish to give service to the town, those sessions typically take place in May and June at the Town Hall, and the dates and times are well publicized, strike that are publicized well in advance. 
I draw your attention to the moderator's message that is set forth at pages three and four of the warrant booklet. And there, rather than go into the detail that I did last evening, I'll just highlight a couple of things that are essential and, again, may be items that people were either not here last night or were not here when they were read. Just a few things. Any motion and a proposed amendment to a motion that involves the expenditure of money needs to be in writing, as does any other motion or proposed amendment to a motion, unless the motion or proposed amendment is so brief and simple as to be understood easily when it is stated verbally. If any voter wishes to make a motion or an amendment and requires some assistance in doing so, to my right, uh, sitting at the table nearest me, is John Coughlin, our town council, and John will assist in any kind of uh, drafting exercise. Limits on speaking. No one may speak on a subject for more than six minutes the first time or three minutes the second time that person might be recognized. No one may speak on a given matter more than two times unless everyone else who has not spoken has had an opportunity to do so and unless leave of the meeting is first obtained. No speaker is allowed to indulge in personalities, but must confine rather his or her remarks to the matter before the meeting. Uh, again, I've already mentioned about guests. I'll mention again the motion for the previous question. The motion for the previous question when made and accepted is to end discussion and to take an immediate vote on the question before the meeting. The motion for the previous question is not debatable and requires for its adoption a majority vote, simple majority. Voting procedures, of course, our votes are taken in the first instance always by voice vote. If the moderator, and tonight there's just one, if the moderator is in doubt as to the results or if seven voters should rise and question the call, then we proceed to a counted vote. A counted vote, as opposed to a called vote, is taken in the first instance as a standing vote. If seven voters rise to doubt my call or I doubt it myself, except that a ballot vote will be taken instead of a standing vote if either the advisory committee seated to my left, to your right, or 50 voters call promptly for a ballot vote. As a ballot vote takes considerable time, our practice has been not to request a ballot vote in the absence of compelling reasons to do so. I'll just mention also motions for reconsideration. Presuming that tonight is the final installment of annual town meeting 2019, if somebody does wish to move for reconsideration, they would need to do it tonight. And recall that what a motion for reconsideration is, as its name implies, you are seeking to reconsider a matter that has just been decided or has been decided earlier in the evening. And the effect of a motion for reconsideration, if it is passed, which requires a two-thirds majority, is to reconsider the previously taken action. In common parlance, it would be a do-over, and we would then return if the motion for reconsideration were to be adopted, to reconsider and vote a second time on the matter that had been voted on earlier. A motion for reconsideration, uh, once, ha once it has failed, may not be brought up again. If you wish to speak, simply rise and seek my attention. When you are recognized, you should come to a microphone. And again, in terms of microphone logistics, it is essential when you use particularly these mics, not the one that I'm wearing, but when you use these mics, think of it as an ice cream cone. You know, you wouldn't eat an ice cream cone from down here. If you would, I don't want to eat ice cream cones with you. But you need to get right up to the mic and listen to yourself, because if you can't hear yourself, certainly the other voters cannot hear you. And if you are wanting to make comments we want to hear them. Um, one final thing before we move to Article 14. Last night we had the opportunity to acknowledge Dr. Dorothy Gallo for 57 years of service to the town. I think you can all agree that was a special moment for the town and for Dot Gallo. Tonight I'd like to acknowledge another Hingham citizen 
who has given years of selfless service to our town. As with Dot Gallo, Paul Healy is a Hingham native. He's a graduate of Suffolk University, Northeastern, and the Suffolk Law School. Paul today is a practicing lawyer with substantial trial experience. He's also a familiar face in our town. From his early days at Charlie Cushing's filling station near the Buttonwood tree, to delivering your newspapers, to his years of service on the Hingham Police Force. Paul has served the town as a member of the Traffic Committee, one of his personal favorites, I can attest, the Master Plan Committee, and for the better part of 23 years as a member of the Planning Board. During those years, Paul played a pivotal, pivotal part in Hingham's development, including the shipyard, Derby Street, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Complex, and a host of residential, school, and municipal building projects. The capstone of Paul's volunteer service has been his two terms as electman, a tenure that will end on Saturday when we elect his successor. On behalf of a grateful community, we express to you, Paul, our thanks for your service and for all that you have accomplished in your hometown. We thank your beloved wife, Esther, your children, and now your grandchildren for having shared you with us all these many years. As you complete your term on the Board of Selectmen, we wish you all the best, and we remind you that you are welcome to complete a talent bank form, <laughs> which can be readily found at page 94 of your green warrant booklet. The Selectmen, including your successor and the moderator, will begin interviews soon. You open your books, please, to page 37. We will begin with Article 14. We have 32 articles to get through tonight if we are to have the opportunity to complete the warrant this evening. <clears throat> Article 14. Article 14 asks, will the town limit the total amount that may be spent from the building department revolving fund established under Article 18 of the General Bylaws to $350,000 during fiscal 2020. The recommended motion of advisory is an affirmative motion. It is set forth on page 37. Is there discussion? This requires for adoption a simple majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That's a unanimous vote. 15. A similar question. Will the town limit the total amount that may be spent from the Elder Services Revolving Fund established under Article 16 of the General Bylaws to 70000 in fiscal 2020? Again, the recommended motion of advisory is set forth in your book at 37. It's an affirmative motion. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, we come to vote. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That, too, is a unanimous vote. Article 18, uh, 16, rather. Before we come to this, allow me to say one uh, critical thing. This is obviously a modest amount of money, but this requires for adoption, as, as you will see, a four-fifths vote of town meeting. Uh, the rationale, I'll spare you the rationale. Uh, effectively, when you so you just told me you weren't going to tell me, and now you're going to tell me. Uh, basically, if you want to pay a bill in year two that was accrued in year one, it requires uh, a, a higher quantum of vote. Now, under our bylaw, the moderator is authorized to call majority votes and two-thirds majority votes, super majorities. Under state law, a moderator cannot call a four-fifths vote. And we're not about to have a ballot vote on $812.77. <laughs> I did say somewhat tongue-in-cheek at the prep meeting that if this doesn't pass, I'll pay it. 
<laughs> Please don't take me up on that. I think, it, I think it violates some state law. In any event, what we do in the odd instance when we have such a four-fifths vote is we first have it by voice vote. Because if it is unanimous, it's a called vote. If it is not unanimous, then we have to have a counted vote. So, with that introduction, <laughs> the question is, will the town raise and appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money for an unpaid bill of a previous year to Wells Fargo? Now, it's noted that approval of the article or the motion requires a fourth-fifth vote. It received the unanimous support of the advisory committee, the board of selectmen, and the recommended motion is that the town, in fact, transfer from available funds $812.77 to pay what we owe to Wells Fargo. Is there discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. <laughs> 17. 17 um, is one we see each year varying sums, and it asks, will the town raise an appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money to the town's reserve fund for use in this fiscal year, fiscal 2019, which will end June 30th? As the comment indicates, and it's worth, uh, it's a little unusual, uh, this one as compared to other 2020 spending, this article is included each year in the event that the existing reserve fund is not adequate to cover unbudgeted and unanticipated expenses for the balance of the current fiscal year. The specific amount is reported in the brief supplemental report that you have. I will give you the amount in case you did not pick up this one-page report from advisory. The amount that is being recommended by the advisory committee is $777,413. That amount was recommended by the affirmative vote of the advisory on an 11 to 3 count. The selectmen voted unanimously in support of the 777413 figure. This requires for adoption a simple majority. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, we come to vote. All those in favor of the recommended motion of advisory, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. <clears throat> Article 18 relates to the country club. It involves borrowing and consequently requires a two-thirds vote of the meeting. Article 18 asks the following question. Will the town raise, appropriate, borrow, or transfer from available funds a sum of money in the amount of $550,000 for the purchase of golf course maintenance equipment for South Shore Country Club? The comment just at the beginning speaks to the Country Club's request to borrow $415,000, less than the amount that was originally requested. And you will see that the recommended motion of advisory is that the town appropriate a sum of money, not in excess of 415000 so less than was you were warned about in the article, for the purchase of golf course maintenance equipment for the country club. To meet the appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the selectmen, is authorized to borrow the sum under applicable Massachusetts law, and then any bond premiums that we might receive upon the sale of bonds or notes approved by your vote, less any premium applied to the payment of costs of issuance would be applied in accordance with applicable Massachusetts law. The recommended motion of advisory received the unanimous support of that committee as well as the unanimous support of the Board of Selectmen. Is there a discussion? If not, we come to vote. Requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. Article 19. Article 19 asks the following. <clears throat> it asks, will a town vote to establish a municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund under Chapter 45G to receive revenues from boat excise taxes under General Laws 60B 2, 
Romanet I, and to receive revenue from mooring permit fees under General Laws 91, Section 10A, and to receive any additional sums from the Commonwealth or the federal government, and to require that 50% of those boat excise taxes collected under 60B2I shall be deposited into the fund as required by law, and that all mooring permit fees collected under Chapter 91, Section 10A shall be deposited into said fund as required by law, and provided further that appropriations from the Waterways Improvement Fund shall be limited to the following as required by applicable mass law, maintenance, dredging, cleaning and improvement of harbors, inland waters, and great ponds of the Commonwealth located in the town of Hingham, the public access thereto, breakwaters, retaining walls, piers, wharves, and moorings thereof, law enforcement and fire prevention associated therewith. And the comment right at the beginning explains that in order to be eligible to apply for any available state dredging permits, strike that permits, grants, the town must have a municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund. The advisory committee and the board of selectmen have voted unanimously in favor of this article. And it is set forth on page 39 of your warrant booklet. I know that Mr. Reardon uh, wishes to be recognized to give comment on 19, and I think some of that will um, segue into 20 and 21. These are all related to the harbor, to dredging of the harbor, 19, 20, and 21. So Bill, if you've kindly come forth and make certain you can be heard, please. Am I eating the mic? Bill Reardon, 9 Steamboat Lane, Chairman of the Harbor Development Committee. The subject of this article, 19, and the next two articles, 20 and 21, is preparation for the dredging of the Inner Harbor Basin just off Town Pier. I'd like to introduce these articles and provide some context for this discussion. Since I first came to Hingham in 1956, we have needed to dredge the harbor roughly every 10 years. Harbor was last dredged in the winter of 2009-2010 to the targeted depth at mean low tide of six feet. Silt from Town Brook, shifting sands from the bathing beach and the tide action gradually fill in the basin as each year passes so that now we are well short of that targeted depth. At low tide, many power boats are resting on the mud, sailboats are leaning over, resting on their keels, and the basin channel is often too shallow for boats to reach the town dock. As we approach this dredging cycle, we are also aware of a number of changes in the environment since we last dredged. First, there are clearly fewer state matching funds for dredging, and they are now being administered not by the Fisheries Division of the Department of Environmental Management, but by the Office of Economic Development, with a focus on building economic value from dredging projects. There's also a new state law regarding the, regarding the disposition of all harbor-related revenues, principally boat and float mooring fees and one-half of boat excise taxes. Now they must all be deposited in a, in a new municipal waterways fund, whereas previously they were captured in a number of different funds from the, within the town system of accounts. So the purpose of the next three articles is to create, consolidate, and appropriate. The first, Article 19, would for the first time create a, a speci specially designated municipal waterways improvement and maintenance fund and require that all prospective harbor revenues be deposited and accumulate there. These funds could only be used for the items that Mike just read, and I'm not going to read them again for you. I will point out that the last item, which speaks about law enforcement and fire prevention, also covers capital expenditures for the harbor master, such as uh, new boats and replacement engines. Article 20 would appropriate up to $5 million for dredging in the winter of 2019-2020, this, this coming winter. This cost figure is an estimate based, prepared based on a sonar-generated analysis of the volume of material we need to dredge to reach our six-foot targeted depth and a cost estimate to dredge and remove that volume of material prepared by our dredging consultant, Foth Engineering. 
We won't know the final cost until we go out for the bids later this spring. The source of that $5 million would be $1.5 million from the newly created Waterways Fund, after it is funded, and up to $3.5 million, $3 million of borrowings. Those borrowings would be reduced by state grants from the Commonwealth, if any, which could be up to one half of the dredging costs, or $2.5 million. The state grant cycle starts with an application due by this May 1st, with notice of awards later this spring. Of course, these state grants are competitive, and we don't know how many other towns will be vying for this grant money, but we have worked very hard to be shovel ready with a clear dredging plan. Article 21 would transfer dollars previously collected and reserved and consolidate them into the new waterways fund created by Article 19. Sources of these transfers include reserved amounts in an earlier form of the waterways fund, mooring permit fees collected and reserved in prior years, estimated fiscal year 2019, the year we're in, mooring permit fees, one half of, of estimated fiscal year 19 boat excise taxes, and fiscal year 19 parking license fees. The result of all these transfer fees will be a waterways fund balance of approximately 1.5 million as we begin fiscal year 2020, this July 1st. And you may wonder, beyond approving this dredging cycle, what would be the impact of the actions we take tonight if we vote affirmatively for all three of these articles? The most important result would be the prospective accumulation of all harbor revenues in one very visible waterways account to eliminate the search in prior years to find where the relevant available dollars are. I've participated in that search several times. This also puts us in compliance with the new portions of the law for harbor revenues. The Selectmen and Advisor Committee appreciate that harbor dredging is one of those recurring items of capital expenditure that need to be planned for on a regular basis, like road repairs or replacement of police cruisers. They have indicated their intent to recommend very conservative spending from this account in order to be that much better prepared for the next dredging cycle, which would presumably occur in 2029 and 2030. So, in conclusion, you all should know that each of Articles 19, 20, and 21 were unanimously recommended by the Harbor Development Committee, the Board of Selectmen, and the Advisory Committee, recognizing the importance of this infrastructure issue to our harbor and to our town. Therefore, I urge you to vote affirmatively for all three articles. Thank you for your attention. Is there further, dis <clears throat> Is there further discussion? Yes, Mr. Friedman. Dennis Friedman, 445 Cushing Street. I was just wondering uh, when the last time mooring fees were raised and if we've recently surveyed mooring fees to see if we're competitive in, with other harbors in the area. Mr. Mr. Reardon. Mr. Moderator, I would ask that uh, Ken Corson, our town harbor master, who's not a resident of the town, uh, answer that question because he will do it more completely than I will. Mr. Corson is our harbor master. He is not a registered voter here in Hingham. Consequently, he will need the approval of the meeting by majority vote to address the matter that Mr. Friedman has posed. All those in favor of hearing harbor master Corson respond, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Mr. Corson. If you can identify yourself, your place of residence, please, and speak right into that microphone. Good evening. My name is Ken Corson. I'm your Harbor Master. I reside in Weymouth, Massachusetts. To answer that question, the last time mooring fees were raised, or actually the last time we did a full survey of mooring fees was 2017. 
Since then, we've, the, through the Board of Selectmen, we've set up a schedule for morning fee increases. They started at $7, and for the last three years, they've gone up 50 cents every year. Currently, morning fees are at $8.50. Next year, they'll go up to $9 per foot. Our rate is competitive compared to all communities that are similar in size and provide the same type of services. So I think that the current fee is appropriate, and it's doing a good job of raising revenues, not only for dredging, but for, for other types of harbor expenses. Thank you, Mr. Corson. Thank you. Is there further discussion? If not, we come to vote on the recommended motion under Article 19, set forth at page 39 of your warrant booklet. This requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Article 20 asks, will the town vote to raise an appropriate borrower transfer from available funds, a sum of money for the dredging of Hingham Harbor? This requires for adoption a two-thirds vote. Mr. Reardon has already adverted to the substance of what is set forth under Article 20. On page 40, you see the recommended motion of the advisory committee. It comes to you unanimously from advisory and the selectmen and harbor development. Recommended that the town appropriate $1.5 million from the Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund or its predecessor funds for the dredging of Hingham Harbor. In addition, that the town appropriate an amount not in excess of $3.5 million to dredge the harbor. To meet the appropriation, the treasurer, with the approval of the selectmen, is authorized to borrow the sum under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 7, or any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the town, therefore. And then we also have the customary reference to premiums and the like. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 20? Hearing none, we come to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. Article 21 on page 40. Will the town vote to appropriate or transfer from available funds a sum of money, which sum was generated from fees paid to the town during fiscal 19, from any parking license for the purpose of accessing, accessing slips or moorings, any capital dredging fund, mooring or docking permit revenues, mooring docking permit late fees, boating fines and or boat excise taxes for deposit to the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund to be used in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 5G. Mr. Reardon's comments already speak to the Text comments on page 40. The article is recommended for affirmative action given that Article 19 uh, has been adopted. Consequently, it comes to you with the approval of the Advisory Committee and the Board of Selectmen, both unanimously. The text is set forth on page 40. Recommended that the town transfer $754,750 in mooring permit fees through June 30th, 18 and approximately $375,000 during fiscal 19 from three categories of available reserves, all to the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund, which sums were generated from fees paid to Hingham from parking license for the purpose of accessing slips or moorings, mooring and docking permit revenues, mooring docking permit late fees, boating fines, and boat excise taxes for deposit to the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund to be used in accordance with applicable Massachusetts law. That the town transfer $371,408.35 from the Waterways Fund to the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund, which, which sum was generated from fees paid to the town through June 30th, 18, for many voting, voting fines or other Boat excise taxes for deposit to the Municipal Waterways Improvement and Maintenance Fund to be used in accordance with General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 5G. Unless there is further discussion, we come to vote. All those in favor of the recommended motion of advisory, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. That too is a unanimous vote. We come to 22. 22 is our CPC. Uh, 
fund. And we do Article 22 in a fashion similar to Article 6. <clears throat> Begins at page 40 and relates to a number of recommendations from the CPC. Similar to the procedure that we follow for Article 6, I will now read each amount recommended for appropriation under Article 22 for fiscal year beginning July 1, 2019, or to be set aside for later spending, in each case as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee. If you would like to raise a question or objection with regard to any particular item, after I have read the item and the dollar amount, simply say hold so that I will hear you. Then I'll mark hold next to any item so held in my book. We'll put aside the held items until we have completed the reading of the whole list, at which point we'll take up the items that have not been held, as to which no question has been raised, and vote on those all together. Then we'll go back and take up any item that has been held one by one and allow discussion, questions, and debate, and any alternative motions with regard to any of those items. Action under Article 22 will not be considered final so as to require a two-thirds vote for reconsideration or any other procedure applicable to reconsideration until all action under Article 22 has been completed. Is there any introduction that CPC wishes to make? Thank you. So the article begins at 22. But what I will do is read the recommended motion in each case that is on page 45. <clears throat> I note that the advisory committee voted 10 to 2 in support of the projects, and that the Board of Selectmen and the CPC as a committee voted unanimously in support of the listed projects. <clears throat> so the recommendation is as follows, that the town appropriate or set aside for later spending funds as recommended by the Community Preservation Committee as follows. One, appropriate $50,000 for the, from the Community Preservation General Fund for addition to the Community Preservation Committee's Administrative Fund. Appropriate $300,000 from the Community Preservation Community Housing Reserve and from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by the Hingham Affordable Housing Trust and for the Affordable Housing Trust Opportunity Fund. Appropriate $19,528 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by Liberty Plain Cemetery Corporation to continue to restore and conserve markers and gravestones within the Liberty Plain Cemetery located at 990 Main Street, Map 180, Lot 20 to appropriate $121,651 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by the Hingham Memorial Bell Tower Committee to restore the mechanisms of six bells located at 68 Rear Main Street, Map 61, Lot 124A. To appropriate $29,921 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by the Hingham Historical Society for stabilization of Old Ordinary House and 1906 Annex at 21 Lincoln Street, Map 61, Lot 21. To appropriate $60,000 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by the Hingham Recreation Commission to conduct a comprehensive study of Hingham's athletic fields, outdoor tennis courts, and basketball courts. To appropriate $120,000 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by the trustees of the Hingham Bathing Beach for additional funding to complete the bathhouse concession stand located at 0 Otis Street, Map 50, Lot 50. To appropriate $24,445 from the Community Preservation General Fund to be used by Hingham School Committee to assist with making Plymouth River School Playground AAB compliant, the playground being located at 200 High Street, Map 124, Lot 32. Having heard no holds on those, do we have any discussion? If not, we come to vote on the package. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. <clears throat> Next relates to an act that would establish 
a Hingham means tested property tax exemption. This article begins at page 23. I'll read parts of it, but not the entire thing. Will the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the General Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, that's our legislature, in accordance with applicable Massachusetts law and the Articles of Amendment to the Constitution to enact legislation in substantially the following form, provided that the General Court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. Now, if you turn to page 46, carrying over to 47, I'll abstract a portion of the comment, which I think will give some meaning, no pun intended, to this article. This article is designed to initiate special legislation for means-tested property tax relief for a specifically identified group of Hingham seniors. Those longtime residents who meet certain income and asset criteria. The town's current statutory exemptions available to Hingham seniors include all those contained in General Laws 59, Chapter 59. The purpose of this article is to add an additional exemption to help alleviate an escalating tax burden that could for force those on fixed incomes to sell their homes. You will see on 47 that the advisory committee and the selectmen voted unanimously in support of this article. Carrying over onto 47, that the town authorized the board of selectmen to petition the general court in accordance with article 89, article two, section eight, mass general law constitutional amendment, article two, section eight of the articles of amendment to the constitution of the commonwealth to enact legislation in substantially the form set forth with the same proviso that the general court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of this petition. Are there questions? Seeing none, this requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor of the recommended motion under Article 23, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. Article 24. Article 24 asks the following question. Will the town vote to raise appropriate borrower transfer from available funds an amount up to $350,000 to be expended under the direction of the school committee upon the recommendation of the 2017 school building committee for the purpose of funding foster elementary school extraordinary maintenance capital needs for the existing school building. Now the comment states quite succinctly that the article is seeking appropriation from available funds of $350,000 for any extraordinary maintenance capital needs that arise from Foster Elementary School. As the comment continues, Foster is now nearly 70 years old. The town and the school administration are in the process of determining the best way to either renovate or rebuild Foster. And they are seeking interim funding, essentially, to do necessary uh, upgrades the advisory committee and the board of selectmen have joined the school committee in inviting your support of this article by their unanimous vote. And I'll just read the, the recommended motion of advisory. That the town vote to transfer from available funds $350,000, an amount of $350,000 to be expended under the direction of the school committee upon the recommendation of the 2017 school building committee for purpose of funding foster elementary school extraordinary maintenance needs for the existing school building. Does anyone from the school committee wish to speak? Ms. Ayer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Ayer, 41 Hemlock Road and chair of the Hingham School Committee. 
As the saying goes, democracy is not a spectator sport. So on behalf of the Hingham School Committee, all of whom are here with me tonight, we thank you for participating in game two of the town meeting. I will take just a few minutes tonight to discuss Warrant Article 24, a request for up to $350,000 to be used for potential extraordinary maintenance needs at Foster School. For a bit of background, Foster School is one of the few institutions in Hingham that has devoted more years of service to our students than Dr. Gallo has. <laughs> Built in 1951, Foster School is currently home to nearly 500 students, grades K through five. The building was expanded in 1957 and renovated in 1974. In 2006, the facility master plan of the town identified the need for Foster School to be rebuilt. But due to competing priorities, including Hingham Middle School and East School, the rebuild of Foster was postponed. And instead, in 2008, repairs were completed at Foster School to extend the useful life of that building by 10 years. That was 11 years ago. As you can see in this photo, Foster does remain a vibrant, welcoming school. It's home to eager students, a dedicated staff, a devoted PTO, and an enormously talented and hardworking maintenance and custodial staff who keep the building clean and safe, as you can see from this photo of the exterior of the building. However, there are three significant concerns inside the building. Heat, electric, and pipes. So let's start with the heat, or lack thereof. The original steam heat system is no longer operating the way it should be. On any given day, temperatures in different parts of this building can range from 50 degrees to 88 degrees, conditions that are clearly not suitable for learning or for working. These wild temperature swings results in students being relocated to other parts of the building and disrupting learning. In the past two and a half months, this has happened 20 times. And in the most severe example, a heating failure on December 11th resulted in the evacuation of the entire Foster School to Hingham High School. Clearly a massive disruption for both schools. Now on to the electric. The original electric wiring and panels simply do not support 21st century learning, and there have been issues with burned out panels, as you can see in the next two slides. Finally, on to the pipes. There are miles of 70-year-old pipes snaking through the building, and they are corroding, causing leaks, slip and fall hazards, damage to ceilings, tiles, floors, and walls. So if you take a look at these pictures in the next couple slides, you'll see the labyrinth of pipes. Sorry, that's not that easy to see. Um, the next slide is an example of one of the broken pipes. And then the next example is a floorboard that was destroyed by water. So clearly Foster School has a significant capital need. But any, re any building project, be it a remodel or a rebuild, is still several years away. And we need your support tonight to establish this fund to complete potential repairs and maintenance that we may need to complete over the next few years. Just to be clear, <clears throat> any funds we don't need will be returned to the town, but having these funds available, available to complete extraordinary repairs will allow us to maintain the viability of Foster School without taking capital away from our other schools. These funds can help us avoid Foster becoming unusable, which would force overcrowding at all of Hingham schools or strain town resources if alternate educational space needs to be rented, which could negatively impact property values across town. Just so everyone's aware, the school committee, the Friends of Hingham Public Schools, the school building committee, and multiple town officials are working together to develop a long-term solution for the Foster school needs, which includes a submission of a third statement of interest to the Massachusetts School Building Authority that, if accepted, would provide us with a portion of funding from the state to help us complete a rebuild or renovation of the school. But again, that solution is several years off, and Foster may very likely need extraordinary maintenance and repairs that will be funded through this Warren article. So, with the unanimous support of the school committee, the board of selectmen, the advisory committee, and on behalf of our teachers and our students, I respectfully ask you to voice your support for Warren Article 24. Thank you.
Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 24? If not, we come to vote. This requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor of the recommended motion, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. We now go to 25. Article 25 asks, will the town vote to raise an appropriate borrower transfer, for, no, transfer from available funds an amount up to $550,160 for the purpose of replacing the cholesterol windows and completing other work related to this project here at Hingham High School? This requires a two-thirds vote for adoption as it requires borrowing. The advisory committee and the board of selectmen voted unanimously in favor of this article. The recommended motion of advisory is set forth at page 49 and tracks the language of the article itself. Is there a discussion? Michelle? Michelle Ayer again on behalf of the school committee. Hello again. Uh, Michelle Ayer, 41 Hemlock Road, and chair of the Hingham School Committee. Um, last, just a quick background. Last year, town meeting appropriated $60,000 of funds to assess and provide design services to replace the Claire Story windows. These are the windows around this gym. Um, due to structural issues that were found in 2017. The windows are currently covered with a mesh wire um, due to the danger of falling glass blocks. But the photos behind me show the, um, the windows and the damage that's been done over the years. Um, design work has been completed, and in a spot of good news, the actual cost to repair the windows is significantly less than the original estimated cost of $1 million. So as follow up to last year's approved warrant article, Warrant Article 25 seeks approval to appropriate, borrow, or transfer funds of up to $550,166 to replace the Claire Story windows and to complete other work related to the project at Hingham High School. This amount does include a 15% potential construction cost contingency. So along with the unanimous support of the school committee, school department, ADCOM, and board of selectmen, I respectfully request your support of Warrant Article 25 to appropriate funds to replace the windows. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 25? Hearing none, we come to vote. This motion requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It is a unanimous vote. We come to Article 26. Let's give me a moment, please. Yeah. 26. Will the town authorize the school department to enter into leases of up to five years for the purposes of purpose rather of leasing school buses and special education vans used for regular special education, regular and special education transportation? The advisory committee and the board of selectmen voted unanimously in support of the article, and the recommended motion of advisory is as follows, set forth at 49, moving on to 50. The recommended motion itself is on 50. That the town authorized the school department through the end of fiscal 2020 to enter into leases up to five years for the purpose of leasing school buses and vans for transporting students. Is there a discussion? Yes, sir, Mr. Friedman. Dennis Friedman, 445 Cushing Street. I have a question and then I'd like to continue my comment. Is it our intention to have all school buses and vans equipped with seat belts? Dr. Gallo for the school committee. Dorothy Gallo, one volunteer road superintendent of schools. Not all of our buses have uh, seat belts. We are experimenting with a couple of the new buses for seat belts 
particularly on buses that travel on highways, such as might be used for a field trip or such as might be used for the METCO route, which goes uh, in and out of town every day. Uh, we do have some members of our school committee who feel very strongly on this issue, and uh, we're looking at the uh, situations where we have seat belts now as exploratory and may see further requests in future years for more such um, safety precautions. Thank you. So, so just briefly, uh, uh, I'm guessing that most of you require your kids to uh, use seat belts in the car. I think it's a state law. Uh, seat belts were required in automobiles in 1967. So I think uh, our kids deserve the same protection in their school buses that they have in their personal vehicles. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 26? If not, we come to vote. This is a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Article 27, it's at page 50. Article 27 asks, will the town accept the provisions of the referenced Massachusetts law known as the Act Relative to Veterans Benefits Rights Appreciation Validation and Enforcement signed into law last August, which provides for a property tax exemption for any real estate that is the domicile of a person but is owned by a trustee, a conservator, or other fiduciary for that person's benefit if the real estate would be eligible for exemption under the referenced law if the person were to be the owner of the real estate or act on anything related thereto. This article was inserted into this year's warrant at the request of the Hingham Veterans Council, and there is a useful comment that reads as follows. The purpose of this Article 27 is to provide real estate property tax relief in the form of an exemption to veterans who would have already been eligible for such exemption under the clauses referenced above, even if the veteran has conveyed the property to a trust. The town of Hingham expects to receive partial and in some cases full reimbursement from the Commonwealth for each exemption if adopted. The advisory committee and the board of selectmen voted unanimously in support of this article. The recommendation of advisory at 50 is that the town accept the provisions of General Laws 59.5, Clause 22G, inserted by Chapter 218 of the Acts of 2018, known as the BRAVE Act. Is there discussion on the recommendation under Article 27? Seeing none, we come to vote. Requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. That too is unanimous vote. 28. Article 28 asks, will the town accept the provisions of the reference BRAVE Act, which provides for a property tax exemption for real estate to the full amount of the taxable valuation of the real property of the surviving parents or guardians of soldiers, sailors, members of the National Guard, and veterans who during active military, strike military, during active duty service suffered an injury or illness documented by the United States Department of Veteran Affairs or a branch of the armed services, armed forces rather, that was approximate cause of death or two, are missing in action with a presumptive finding of death as a result of active duty service as a member of the armed forces of the United States. I'll jump down to the comment. The purpose of this article is to grant a full exemption of property tax to gold star parents or guardians of soldiers and sailors, members of the National Guard and veterans who have died or are missing in action and presumed dead. The town of Hingham expects to receive a full reimbursement for this exemption from the Commonwealth. The advisory committee and the board of selectmen voted unanimously in support of this article and the recommended motion of advisory 
is at the bottom of 50 carrying over to 51. That the town accept the provisions of General Laws 59.5, Clause 22nd H, known as an act relative to veterans' benefits, rights, appreciation, validation, and enforcement that was added to the general laws by Chapter 218 of the Acts of 2000, to, uh, Chapter 218 of the Acts of 2018. Is there discussion? Yes. Uh, Megan Buer, 489 Main Street. I'm just wondering why it's just parents and if there's any sort of spouse benefit that was considered? So either Mr. Gatos or Mr. German want to respond to Megan's question? Keith German, 104 Kilby Street, Director of Veteran Services for the Town of Hingham. Uh, that referenced article, Clause 22D, as in Delta, provides for Gold Star spouses. That law is already in effect. This, in effect, would cover those members of the armed forces, as was mentioned, who pertain to leave Hingham, for instance, a son or daughter who is not married and never returns to their home. So it would provide for those parents who still reside in town the opportunity for us as citizens of the town to say we think you have given enough, that you need give no more, and that we will not take your taxes and thank you for your service to this country. Is there further discussion? If not, we come to vote. This motion requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? It's a unanimous vote. 29. Article 29 asks, will the town vote to amend the bylaws of the town by adding the far following Article 44? I'll abstract this because it's quite lengthy. The goal of the proposed bylaw at the end of section one, you'll see on page 51, the goal of the bylaw is to reduce the common use of plastic checkout bags and to promote the use of reusable bags by consumers, thereby reducing local land and marine pollution, reducing waste, reducing the environmental impact of paper bags, protecting the town's unique natural beauty and irreplaceable natural resources and improving the quality of life for citizens of Hingham. The recommended bylaw is set forth at several pages. And if you turn to page 53, you will see that the advisory committee, the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support the proposed article. And then the text of the proposed bylaw is set forth at page 53, carrying over to page 54, and ending at page 54. So this is the, came to us from the Cleaner Greener Committee, the official name of which is the Long Range Waste Disposal and Recycling Committee. And we have with us tonight, not only members of course of that committee, but we have with us tonight three Hingham students, Lydia Bohr, Emily Goldstein, and Maya Nielsen. Now, none of Lydia, Emily, and Maya is old enough to vote, uh, but they are old enough to take action. Uh, so they are Hingham High School residents. They are members of the Green Committee of Hingham High School, and Lydia and Maya request the approval of the meeting to address the meeting because they're not registered voters, although they are Hingham residents. So I would invite by majority vote you to consider whether you wish to hear Lydia and then Maya speak briefly to the meeting. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. 
Ladies? Just speak strongly into the mic, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Lydia Bohr, and I am here today on behalf of the Hingham High Green team to talk to you about the harmful effects of plastic bags. Sure, plastic bags are most likely a part of all our lives, and why wouldn't they be? When supermarkets and convenience stores package your food in these with just a mere 10 cent charge, it becomes so easy for the average American to use 300 to 700 bags per year. Annually, that amounts to 30 to $70. Not too bad, right? Now multiply that by the 23,000 people that live in Hingham. Now that's a lot of money that could be spent on bigger and better things, such as food pantries, homeless shelters, and environmental cleanup organizations. Obviously, plastic bags cost a lot of money to use, but what happens after you discard them at the dump? Here's what supermarkets fail to tell you. There's a price to pay to clean up after your waste. If you walk away from tonight's meeting with nothing but a simple phrase, let it be this. Nothing is for free. While we may not pay for plastic bags directly when we go shopping, they are anything but complimentary. Someone has to pay the after cost of dealing with plastic bags waste. Someone has to pay for regular cleanups to remove litter along our highways or the waste blown away from landfills. And guess who that someone is? That someone is you. The cost to clean up your plastic bags is approximately 17 cents per bag, almost double the cost of purchasing one. Taxpayers, including you, end up paying about $88 per year on just plastic bag waste. Not too bad, right? Now add that to the $70 per year you pay for the usage of plastic bags and multiply that number by the 23,000 people that live in Hingham. Maybe that free plastic bag isn't so free after all. However, there is a solution, reusable bags. We all have them, and if we don't, we can pay $5 to own one for our entire lives. No cleanup cost, no waste fee. That's a single $5 purchase, as opposed to the $158 you spend annually on plastic bags. That's a huge difference, but it doesn't need to happen all at once. It starts with just one supermarket removing plastic bags, and then the trend in Hingham will grow. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maya Nielsen. I'm a junior at the high school, and I'm also part of the Hingham High Green Team. So real quick, before we all stop listening and start thinking about what we want for dinner or how long this is going to last, um, I'd like a show of hands. How many of you currently at your house or in your car have a collection of reusable bags? Right? Maybe they're all stuffed into one large reusable bag or spread out in different closets or stashed in one forgotten corner of your home. We all have them. They are thrust upon us at conferences, homecoming booths, grocery stores, and nearly everywhere else. We are all armed and ready in Hingham to face a life without single-use plastics. What we are needlessly spending money on right now, though, is disposing of plastic grocery bags. I recently worked behind the scenes at the transfer station, loading plastic bottles and cans into a truck. And next to that truck was a ginormous container filled with compacted plastics. To isolate those plastics, we have to pay to have them sorted out of the plastic bag section that people throw them in, and to have misplaced plastic bags sorted out of the recycling section. By banning plastic bags, we could put those tax dollars to a better use. But this isn't just a Hingham problem. Plastic bags are a global issue. Every second around the world, people use 160,000 plastic bags. And while some of those bags are then used to pick up after your dog or line your trash cans, most of them are not. They get into our water, our trees, and our soil. In the oceans, sea life think that plastic bags are food. And once eaten, those plastic bags are never digested. For example, in 2008, a sperm whale was found beached in California with 45 pounds of plastic in its stomach. So why are we concerned? You might think that plastic in the ocean isn't really a big deal, because we're not ingesting it. But in reality, the chemicals from plastic bags leach into our soil and our waterways. From the soil, those chemicals leach into our food, and we are eating those plastic bags that never break down. Additionally, the environmental impact of plastic bags is catastrophic. Companies use petroleum, natural gas, and harmful chemicals, which are all toxic to the environment. 
This production pollutes the air we breathe and destroys crucial habitats. And I don't know about you, but I hope to live on this earth for a good while longer, and I don't want it destroyed. I'm not just a single student with an opinion either. I represent a generation around the world that will be affected by pollution, contamination, and climate change. I know that a single town banning plastic bags won't change much, but our world is made up of single towns that, when combined, can make a real difference. I cannot vote on this issue, but you all can. So make the right choice. Think about the future you want for your children and their children to come. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 29? If not, we come to vote. Requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor of the recommended motion of advisory, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes clearly have it. The motion is adopted. Article 30. Article 30. Article 30 asks, will the town appropriate, raise, borrow, transfer from available funds a sum of money to be used to install a fiber optic municipal area network with redundancy in and between all town buildings? The comment states at the beginning, the article seeks to appropriate funds not to exceed $500,000 to install a fiber optic municipal area network in and between town-owned buildings. Now this does involve borrowing and consequently requires for adoption a two-thirds vote. Advisory and the selectmen have voted unanimously in support of the article. I will read the recommended motion in substantive part that the town appropriate an amount not to exceed $500,000 to be used to install a fiber optic municipal area network with redundancy in and between town buildings. To meet said appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the Board of Selectmen is authorized to borrow said sum under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 44, Section 7, or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore. Is there a discussion of the recommended motion under Article 30? Yes, Mr. Friedman. Dennis Friedman, 445 Cushing Street. I believe I heard earlier in the meeting we have about $30 million in reserves. Uh, which exceeds the financial policy of the town. So why are we borrowing half a million dollars to do this? Thank you. Ms. Straley, for advisory, am I correct that you've got this one? Apparently I'm incorrect. The essential question that Mr. Friedman posed was, given the amount that the town has in reserves, why are we even considering borrowing this fund? I will read again the article. Will the town raise an appropriate borrow or transfer from available funds a sum of money to be used to install a fiber optic municipal area network with redundancy? Hi, I'm Julie Straley, 231 Levitt Street, speaking for the advisory committee. Um, the town administrator um, put forth this article um, uh, with the um, to borrow the money because the town policy is to borrow um, money for um, projects five hundred thousand dollars or greater. So it was their choice. Thank you. Mrs. Any Ray. other questions? You may step aside if you would. Mr. Friedman apparently has a follow-up question. So what if I would like to offer an amendment. Uh, probably doesn't need to be in writing. I would like to strike the word borrow from this uh, recommended motion. Thank you. Mr. Friedman has proposed striking the word borrow from the recommended motion of advisory. Uh, is there a second on Mr. Friedman's motion? The motion has been duly made and seconded. It is simple enough that it does not need to be in writing, but it requires for adoption a majority vote of the meeting. 
All those in favor of Mr. Friedman's recommended motion, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. No. The noes clearly have it. The motion to amends has failed. We come to the recommended motion of advisory, which I've already read. It's set forth at page 54. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes clearly have it. More than two-thirds having voted in favor of the recommended motion, it passes. 31. 31 asks, and I won't read all of the map and lot references, will the town vote to approve the filing of an amended petition with the Massachusetts Interagency Permitting Board to designate property located at zero Southeast Expressway, consisting of approximately 161 acres of land and including a previously designated 25-acre parcel, formerly known as Zero Commerce Road, as a priority development site under Chapter 43D of the Massachusetts General Laws, as amended, pursuant to Section 11 of the Chapter 205 of the Acts of, Acts of 2006, and to amend the vote adopted under Article 50 of the 2012 Annual Town Meeting, in which the town originally accepted the provisions of Chapter 43D, and to correct the assessor's map and lot information and or street address for the following properties. 99 Industrial Park Road, 5 Pond Park, 20 Pond Park, and 75 Abington Street, formerly 105 Research Road. The comment speaks to the purpose of the article being to correct and in one respect to expand authorizations granted by previous town meetings relative to the inclusion of the South Shore Park, formerly known as South Shore Industrial Park, in the state's priority development site program. That carries over onto 55. And then on 56, you will see uh, right after the indented and bulleted sections, if the article is approved, the town expects to submit a new application to the Interagency Permitting Board. Advisory supported this article by a vote of 13 to 1, and the Board of Selectmen supported it unanimously. The recommended motion of advisory tracks the article. I will read it briefly that the town approved the filing of an amended application with the Massachusetts Interagency Permitting Board for the designation of the following pro properties as priority development sites under 43D of the Massachusetts General Laws. Zero Southeast Expressway, including the parcel formerly known as Zero Commerce Road, 99 Industrial Park Road, 5 Pond Park, 20 Pond Park, and 75 Abington Street, formerly 105 Research Road. This requires for adoption a simple majority. Is there discussion? If not, we come to vote on the recommended motion under 31. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Unanimous vote. 32. Article 32 asks the following question. Will the town authorize the Board of Selectmen to petition the General Court of the Commonwealth in accordance with applicable Massachusetts law to enact legislation in substantially the following form, provided that the General Court may reasonably vary the form and substance of the requested legislation within the scope of the general public objectives of the petition? If you turn to the comment, I think it will help you understand the question you're being invited to consider. Beginning of the comment, it says, this article would authorize the Board of Selectmen to request that the Mass Legislature enact special legislation authorizing Hingham to adopt a more streamlined procedure for the town to accept as public ways roads in a subdivision. When the subdivision has been reviewed pursuant to Hingham's subdivision control law approval process and has been approved by the Hingham Planning Board. This streamlined process would permit the town to rely on the assessor's records as to property owners and thereby save the town and those asking that a street be accepted the time and expense of a full title examination of the property. 
Under current procedure, a full title exam is required. I note before the recommended motion that the advisory committee voted 12 to 1 in support of the article, and the selectmen were unanimous in support of the article. The text of the recommended motion follows the text of the article. This, bear with me for a minute, requires only a simple majority for adoption. Is there a discussion on the recommended motion or questions on Article 32? Seeing none, I'd invite a motion. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. That is a unanimous vote on 32. We now come to 33. This requires for adoption under General Laws 4181Y, a two-thirds majority. It reads as follows. Will the town accept the laying out as part of the town way known as Martin's Lane, an approximately 40 square foot parcel of land located to the west of the northwesterly terminus of the existing layout of Martin's Lane, more particularly shown on sheet four of a plan entitled Plan of Martin's Lane, Hingham, Massachusetts, dated January 8, 1947, prepared by Lewis W. Perkins, engineer, and recorded with the Plymouth County Registry of Deeds as referenced. The article seeks to have the town accept a 40 square foot parcel of land adjacent to Martin's Lane along Hingham Harbor in order to make repairs to the entire seawall that exists on that site. Again, under 4181Y of the general laws, this requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. The advisory committee, the board, and the planning board have all voted unanimously to support the article. The text of the recommended motion tracks the article and is set forth in your warrant booklet. Is there a discussion on the recommended motion under 33? Seeing none, we come to vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. 34 on page 58. Ask this question. Will the town authorize but not require the selectmen to acquire by gift and or eminent domain the property known as the Canterbury Street Cemetery shown on Assessor's Map 43, Lot 110, 110th? The comment speaks to what this is, a small 42 by 79 foot parcel of land that was once part of the Barnes estate. It is a repository for the remains of five adults and ch 10 children, all under age 10. The advisory committee has voted 13 to one to support the article, and the selectmen have voted unanimously in support of the article. The recommendation is that the town acquire, authorize rather, but not require, the Board of Selectmen to acquire by gift and or eminent domain the property known as the Canterbury Street Cemetery shown on Assessor's Map 43, Lot 110. Is there discussion? Mrs. Burns. Laura Burns, 479 Main Street. It's my impression that the town does not currently own any cemeteries. Am I right about that? I think we have to ask our cemetery experts. <laughs> well, I'm... <laughs> does I, anyone know the I, question I, to I, answer the Laura's question? I don't believe we own any... I'm, I'm open to being set straight. The town, town historian says we do not own any cemeteries, so I will take Mr. McMillan's we'll take word for that. from the I've had occasion in my wanderings to be uh, in pre presence of other municipal officials who have moaned about the difficulty of maintaining town-owned cemeteries. And I said, you're town-owned cemeteries? And they say, yes. And I said, I don't think we do. And they say, you're very fortunate. And the reason is that this is a very different kind of acquisition than, say, a piece of open space, because it brings with it maybe not a legal, but a moral responsibility to maintain it in a way that demonstrates respect for those lying there. And sometimes uh, that towns find that beyond their ability. Now, I understand this is a very small uh, a lot, but what concerns me is that um, the, uh, 
the quest the uh, comment says the startup cost for the restoration expense would be sought from the town's community preservation act funds in other words has not been secured we haven't seen that and this project is being proposed for acquisition but it hasn't been through the process of standing up next to all the other CPC projects in that year and found worthy of funding. So I guess my question is, why would we acquire this property with, which currently has no visible means of support? Um, and sort of uh, what, would, what will happen if you don't get the CPC funds that you hope to get? How will this property be maintained? Where I, I'm concerned that it will fall on the general fund. Mr. Bellier, would you like to respond on behalf of the advisory committee? Tom Bellier, 1 Sycamore Lane, Bradley Woods, not Bradley Park. Um, in answer to your question, uh, Laura. Right in front of the mic, right. I'm, excuse me? Right in front of the mic, please. Um, in answer to your question, Laura, um, an assessment was done by the uh, DPW superintendent, Randy uh, Sylvester, and cost for annual maintenance would be approximately about $900 per year. Um, this is a very small plot, very interesting to families that were early settlers, the uh, ancestors or descendants of them, um, and CPC has been considered for that Obviously, there's no guarantee that they could receive uh, some funding from them, but I've walked the land myself. I can attest to it. There's really not much that in the way of restoration of uh, damaged uh, headstones or footstones or anything like that. It's a very small piece of land. There's no fencing around it. Statutes uh, require that uh, municipalities very generally um, keep uh, cemeteries like this in good order. Um, if there's fencing that has fallen down, put it back up, replace it, very small uh, appropriations for something like this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Villiers. Is there a further discussion? Yes. Andrea Young, 18 Back River Road. Um, with respect to Laura's question, which is a very good one. Um, We're the, losing your voice, Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. With ice cream cone. With, <laughs> with right. respect to um, Laura's question, um, the, the article says that will the town authorize but not require the Board of Selectmen to acquire this piece of property? And uh, it is probably the case that when we apply for CPC funding, the town, the, the selectmen do not have to act on this um, until we re do receive that funding. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under Article 34? I'm sorry, apparently I have, yes, I'm sorry, all the way. Hi, Paula Mine, 36 Volusia Road. Uh, a number of years ago as a citizen, I tried to get this uh, put up for CPC, um, you know, something to the, for them to fund. And the problem was it wasn't anything that the town could uh, do anything with because it wasn't town owned. So until the town does take control of it, this poor little cemetery is going to disintegrate. There's a tree that fell maybe five years ago that's I think still fallen on the graves. Um, this little cemetery really does appreciate your attention, and if you take control of it, um, you can save that little family before it disappears forever. <laughs> Thank you. Is there further discussion on the recommended? Yes. Maureen Devine, 46 Pioneer Road. Uh, I'm, I'm just unclear as to why we want it, why we want to spend money on it. I'm, I, I hope somebody can help me with that. 
And then the second thing is, I'd like to know, is it full? Can other people be buried there? Just asking. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who would like to respond to the question? Andrea? Andrea Young, 18 Back River Road. Well, I think that's um, a question that we all have to answer for ourselves. Many of us feel that it's a moral responsibility. We discovered this cemetery in 2001 when the Canterbury Estates was being developed. And um, since then, there have been many attempts to try to uh, seek the, the owners um, to see if there was any possibility that someone would take over the maintenance. Uh, and we even tried at several junctures to obtain CPC funds. And as the sport, former speaker said, we couldn't do that because um, we had no claim to that property. So this is our opportunity now to be able to save that little family cemetery. Um, I don't think, first of all, it's, it's um, also very possible, according to preservation consultants who have, who have examined this uh, family burial ground and have done some considerable research, that there are graves that are far older than 1827. The first one that appears is 1827. Um, but there are other markers that indicate to them that there is a possibility that there are other graves. So whether it's full or not, I don't think we plan to use this as a, um, as a um, revenue source. Um, I think it is just now to maintain it and to maintain the dignity of the people who are buried there. Thank you. Mr. Healy. Paul Healy, 209 Main Street, formerly 55 Canterbury Street. I drove by that mound for over 10 years on my way back and forth to work, and I explored it from time to time, and it, it's the remains of a, an old cemetery, an old family, whose name adorns other parts of this town. And unless we do something about it, it will fade into the earth. Years ago, I met my father, and we traveled to see his brother, and he put a weed whacker in the back of his pickup truck, and I said, what do you need that for, Dad? And he said, well, you'll see. Well, his brother, my uncle, is buried on a mountainside in Georgia, and there is no perpetual care there, and you get swallowed into the earth. And, and he's there all right, right next to a Confederate soldier's grave, and it's merged into the earth. This is not this place. I think this is a uh, reflection of our values of the history of this community to try and preserve this very modest place. While I sat on the planning board and Canterbury Estates was being developed, we tried to carve this out to protect it. The developer had no interest in doing it. I think that this is a reasonable opportunity for what we're trying to do here. And I urge that you just reflect that this isn't a place where we're looking to put new people. We're just trying to honor the dead. Thank you very much. Is there further discussion on the recommended motion under 34? Yes. Stephanie McHugh, 17 Howland Lane. Just I have difficulty hearing you. Oh. Stephanie McHugh, 17 Howland Lane. Is, has there been any discussion or exploration on what kind of precedent would be set if we did purchase this, as this would be our first town-owned cemetery? Thank you. So the question before the meeting is the establishment of precedent for such acts. Yes, Susan Murphy is approaching. She is a resident of the town and also serves as Real Estate Council to the town of Hingham. Good evening, Susan Murphy, 11 Daly Road, um, Real Estate Council. Um, I can, I'm gonna try to answer that question. I, 
I've uh, talked to uh, Andrea Young, who you've heard from before, who um, is a resident of the town, also uh, works as staff for the town, for the Historical Commission and the Historic Districts Commission. This is a very unique situation in Hingham. It's not, it's not a situation that's going to create a precedent. What happened with this parcel is just a matter of something that had to do with a defect in the title ownership of the property, where it was after the Barnes family sold off their property, the next owner, when she died, this parcel was its own separate parcel. And her family did not realize that. So when her probate happened, when she passed away, all of the rest of the land was sold off. People may remember that uh, Tower Day Camp was there. But this became a orphan parcel. It never got conveyed. And it stayed in the estate of the woman uh, whose family had sold it to Tower Day Camp. And that is why it sat there abandoned and falling apart for all these years. Um, I'm, I'm counsel now, but I was on the planning board with Mr. Healy for many years, including early 2000 when Canterbury State um, was developed. And that's when it came to our attention. And it's come back up over n numerous years by many residents, who main, a lot of them who live in the neighborhood, saying, you know, why is this like this? And finally, the Historical Commission asked that it be determined what the status was. And I was personally involved in doing a lot of the research and looking at the probate. And so what happened is we were able to identify heirs of the woman who had owned the land and had, it had been conveyed out without this parcel all by itself. Um, I believe two of her granddaughters, uh, one of whom still lives in Hingham. But they, it's not their family that's buried there. So there was no one interested in taking care of it. So to our knowledge, there is no other cemetery, private family cemetery in Hingham like this. And there's no one else. If, if the town doesn't take care of it, no one will. Um, and so that's kind of the history of, of how this came before the town. Thank you. Is there further discussion? If not, we come to vote. Yes, sorry, missed you. Hi, Chris Margotta, 233 South Pleasant Street. I'm just wondering if we acquire this, is it accessible to the public or is it landlocked? I missed your question, miss. Is it accessible to the public or is it landlocked? The question is, is this accessible to the public or is it landlocked? Andrea. Thank you. I wonder if at this point it might be helpful to show Again. some of the pictures of the cemetery so that people can get an idea of where it's located. Okay. So the cemetery itself, if you can see, there's a little square carved out near the um, intersection of Rockland Street and Canterbury Street, almost right at the corner. Can you see that, I hope? It's very small. It's 0.75 acres. This is, um, these are pictures taken from Canterbury Street. The first one on your left is taken uh, from across the street, from where the cemetery is located, and it is, um, I'm facing, actually, toward Rockland Street. The next one on the right-hand side is um, an opposite, uh, it's the opposite view. It's looking down Canterbury Street. So what I want to point out here is that um, anybody can walk up there, and unfortunately, you can tell from the beer cans and, you know, debris that people do go up there. Um, I think the intent for the restoration of this property is to not only repair the headstones, and if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, this, a lot of this stuff we've already talked about, but um, you could go to the next one, thanks. And um, as Susan Murphy already 
explain to you that there were two heirs uh, remaining. Um, there were three, and the, um, one of the gentlemen passed away. But Sarah Lovett lives in town, and Lucia Metcalf lives in New Hampshire, and they have both signed releases because when they were contacted, they had absolutely no idea that they were heirs to this, this small family cemetery. And as Susan mentioned, they, they have no connection to these families. And so they were very happy to release um, ownership of this, this little piece of land. Um, this just goes to show you um, one, of the, one of the headstones that's there. And part of the value of this, and this speaks to um, your question, ma'am, uh, part of the value of this is that there is, uh, these are early slate stones. And they're, um, they are covered in um, gravestone art, which is very valuable. Um, to see because it represents, um, you can actually, not I can, but certain people can tell who actually carved these stones um, based on what designs that they include in there. So, um, you know, this was, these were taken in 2001. And if you go to the next slide. And this is what it looks like now. Um, as someone also mentioned, there are fallen trees. This isn't a, you know, go in there with, you know, your rake and your hoe and your whatever to clean it up. This is serious. This is chainsaws and um, other heavy equipment that needs to um, take care of this. And we did get that estimate from our DPW. So provided that we do get the CPA funds, we will be able to um, clear this out. And the intent is to replace a simple wooden fence, which had been there originally, um, put a sign on it, and it would be accessible um, to anybody who'd like to go and see it. Right now, it's a little difficult to get through there. You have to have um, clippers and gloves, high boots, and maybe a machete would work. But um, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to get through there right now. So. Thank you. Is there further discussion before we come to vote? Yes, sir. Marco Bohr, 33 Elm Street. Just a minor correction. Uh, it's actually 0 0.07 acres, not right. 0 0.75. Thank you. Yes, it's, by my math, 3,318 square feet. It's, it's not 7 tenths of an acre, 7 one hundredths of an acre. So anything more? Yes, sir. Scott Stevenson, 39 Cushing Street. Um, I don't understand why a You're speaking private, to, right into the mic, Scott. I don't understand why a private problem of a private family is demanding municipal ownership of something that we have never owned before, a cemetery. It doesn't make any sense to me. Clearly, there is a need here, but it's a need to be fulfilled by a private organization. We could take a collection here of people who would want to donate to solve this problem, and those people would contribute. I, I know this town. We have a great heart. But buying land by the town is not the solution here. Uh, I do believe that it is to be acquired by gift or eminent domain for whatever its nominal value is. But go ahead. Yes, Miss. I have a quest question. Your name and address, please. Madeline Robertson at 192 North Street. My question is whether there are any local ordinances or regulations that would require the owners to take care of their own property. Thank you. Who would like to uh, answer that question? Susan Murphy. The question being, are there local ordinances that would compel the current owners, I believe, who have already released their rights to maintain this cemetery. No, there isn't. Um, as I said, for many years, there, there was a m misimpression that this little parcel was part of the, the larger development that became the residential development that's there. Um, 
it is a separate parcel that is not owned by any of the residential property owners around there. Um, and if it just remains as it is, um, the tax collector could choose to um, put it into tax title and foreclose, in which case the town would end up owning it anyway. They don't have to. It could just lay there unowned um, and, you know, un unaccounted for. Um, you know, this is a difficult one for me because I'm standing here and I came from the table where I'm real estate counsel, but if everyone will indulge me because I am a resident and I did spend 11 years on the planning board, I just want you to think about in this day and age of Ancestry.com and DNA tests to find out where you come from. There's probably, and we, we, you know, there would have to be a genealogist to figure it out, but there are probably distant cousins, um, relatives of those Barnes and Stoddards in this town and possibly even in this room. Or even think about, as Paul said, family that you may have that passed away in other states or other countries and have their graves in that condition with them laying under them. And so as a resident, and I, and I never do this, and, and I appreciate your indulgence in allowing me to do this, um, I, I would just say that I, I can't imagine as a town that puts the dollars we put in year after year and after year that we don't see this as a historic asset that goes to the very fundamental founding of our town. And for that reason, I, as a, I'm speaking as a resident I, and a voter, I would ask that as a piece of Hingham history, this is as valuable as the old ship church or the Liberty Plain Cemetery that we're helping put a fence around. Um, you know, I, I would say that this is as important and I would ask everyone to vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there is further discussion, we come to vote on the recommended motion under Article 34. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes clearly have it. The motion's adopted. 35. Will the town vote to raise and appropriate borrow or transfer from available funds a sum of money not to exceed $145,000 to be spent by the town for the purposes of funding an updated comprehensive master plan. The comment sets forth the purpose of this vote. It comes to you with the unanimous recommendation of the advisory committee and the board of selectmen that the town appropriate an amount not in excess of 145,000 from available reserves to be spent by the town for the purposes of funding an updated comprehensive master plan. The comment notes that the town's last revised comprehensive master plan was in 2001, and consequently they are seeking to update it. Is there a discussion? This requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. 36. 36 says, will the town vote to establish a master plan committee to report to the planning board on all matters referred to them by the planning board relative to the development of an updated comprehensive master plan? Now, the, there is a typo in the book. Uh, it refers in the comment you know, after the long paragraph. It says, this is recommended for affirmative action only if Article V as in Victor uh, is adopted. That was the previous number, it should be 35. So having uh, decided to fund a master plan effort, we now need a committee to undertake that work. And the advisory committee and the board of selectmen have voted unanimously under your uh, recommendation on page 60, and I will read it. It is recommended that the town vote to establish a master plan committee to report to the planning board on all matters referred to them by the planning board relative to the development of an updated comprehensive master plan. 
The Master Plan Committee shall consist of 13 members determined as follows. A member of the Planning Board who shall serve as Chair of the Master Plan Committee. A member of each of the following boards or their designees. The Selectmen, Health, Historic Districts, ZBA, Harbor Development, Development and Industrial Commission, Affordable Housing Trust, Recreation, Conservation, along with three residents to be appointed by the moderator. So that is the recommendation of the advisory committee with the support of the selectmen to establish a 13-member committee, as I have just detailed, to implement the revision of the master plan, which we've just agreed to do and fund under Article 35. Is there a discussion? Seeing none, we come. Oh, yes, I'm sorry I missed you. Thank you. Sarah Ader, 32 Highview Drive. I'd like to know why there's no representative from the school committee on the master plan. I'm sorry, I missed what the question is why is there no representative from the school committee on that master plan committee? The question has been posed why the school committee does not have a representative on the proposed master plan committee. I'm sorry, Gordon Carr, chairman of the planning board. Good evening, Gordon Carr, 962 Main Street uh, for the planning board. Uh, we fully expect to be working very closely with the uh, school committee through all of this as we have uh, in the past. Uh, these uh, standing committees were the ones that were identified. Um, we fully expect that the school committee and all of the work that they're doing relative to uh, school population, districting, and the, and the school systems are going to play a central role because the educational uh, plans are are essential piece of this effort. Thank you. Is there further discussion? I'll recognize uh, you. <laughs> Michael Jordan, 16, Old Colony Road. That, that didn't really answer the question. <laughs> um, if the school committee is going to be uh, involved, then perhaps we should amend this uh, to include the school committee. Thank you. And yes, you wanted to have a you wanted to have a follow up. Is that sufficient? All right, Carlos De Silva, member of the school committee. Carlos da Silva, member of the school committee, 5 Tarassi Road. I would like to um, ask that uh, respectfully you amend this. Uh, you want to speak into the mic? I would uh, respectfully ask that you amend to um, include a member of the school committee into this master plan committee. Do you wish to make an amendment to that effect, Mr. da Silva? Yes, sir. And you thereby wish to expand the proposed number of committee members to 14? Or perhaps, actually, uh, instead of three citizens, two citizens would be appointed. You'd like to. So, Mr. Silva's um, proposed amendment, which is simple enough, I believe, to um, be presented orally, is to add um, a mem. Well, give me a sec here. To add the school committee to what I will call the litany of organizations and to reduce to two the number of residents to be appointed by the moderator. Is there a second on Carlos's motion? All right, so first what we do is we vote on the proposed amendment. The proposed amendment would, as I said, add the school committee to one of the standing groups each of which would have a member of this committee. So for example, it would say Recreation Committee, comma, Conservation Committee, School Committee, and two residents appointed by the moderator. So we have that now before the body. 
So the first thing we do is we vote on the proposed amendment. So all those, yes, I'm sorry. You may. I'd respectfully like to just suggest that we keep all three of the uh, moderator designees and add the school committee and make it a, a committee of 14. All right, we now have dueling amendments. <laughs> Not to be confused with dueling banjos. Sorry, Gordon Carr, 962 Main Street, just uh, suggesting that we include the school committee and three members uh, appointed by the moderator. The goal of this is to uh, be as inclusive as possible uh, for the town, so I'd rather not uh, reduce the number of uh, participants. 14 is gonna be sufficient, I'm sure. Are you yielding your time, Mr. Carey? <laughs> Tom Carey, 1131 Main Street. I think he may have just made the motion. I intended to, but just so we're clear. Rather than reduce the number of residents, because as much as I love all of our committees and all the work they do, I think a long-range planning committee ought to have a significant number of just plain old residents of the town looking at what's going on. So I would keep the three. Uh, I would prove. If you add the school committee and keep the three, am I right that that leaves you with a committee of 14? You'd have an even number then. Yeah, so I would, I would amend it to say 15, just in case there's a split, and add another resident. So, um, from a... I just remind you how long it took to do the budget last night. <laughs> yes. Hello, Laurie Taylor Kirby, 3 Andorra Lane. Cannot hear you. Uh -oh. Pull the mic down. Yeah. You can just tilt it down. You don't have to modify the I'll break it. height. There you go. go. Laurie Taylor Kirby, 3 Andorra Lane. Could we request, would Mr. De Silva be willing to reword his uh, original amendment to school committee and three residents? so that you wouldn't have dueling amendments? Four residents, whatever. So you know, whatever the numbers are. All right. Bear with me for a moment. I may break with uh, town meeting time and suggest a comprehensive amendment, which seems appropriate since we're talking about a master plan. <laughs> so as I'm understanding the current state of affairs, the primary desire was to add a member um, of the uh, designee of the school committee, which would have taken the number to 14. And there have been a number of adjustments proposed. And what I don't want to do is to have a motion and vote on A, then a vote on B, then a vote on C, then go back to D. Your moderator may get confused. So it sounds as if the comprehensive uh, approach would be to increase the total number of committee members to 15, from the proposed 13, to add as a, effectively a 14th member a school committee person, and to increase the number of residents to be appointed by the moderator to four. So unless I've fouled that up, which I don't think I have, I would ask whether Mr. De Silva who made the original motion, I believe, would accept that as a friendly amendment to his motion. He has, in a dignified way, said, yes, sir. And Mr. Carey has seconded it. So we now come to vote on the uh, compromise amendment that would increase the number to 15 from 13. He would add a school committee person and a fourth resident of the town to be appointed by the moderator. All in favor of that recommended amendment to the main motion as originally proposed, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. The ayes clearly have it, and the, and the amendment has passed. Now we need to vote on the motion as amended. 
that the town vote to establish a master plan committee to report to the planning board on all matters referred to them by the planning board relative to the development of an updated comprehensive master plan committee. The committee shall consist of 15 members, determined as follows. The text would then continue until the second line from the bottom, where we would strike and, we would insert in place of and a comma, we would insert after the words Conservation Commission, the words and the school committee. And then in the second to last line, we would strike the word three and insert the word FOA, for residents appointed by the moderator. So that is the amended motion that is before the meeting. All those in favor of the motion as amended, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Article 37 asks, will the town raise and appropriate or transfer monies from available funds for civil engineering services to design and to develop plans and specifications for the Route 3A Rotary Summer Street Corridor roadway improvements and all incidental costs or, costs or act on anything related thereto? This was inserted into the warrant by the 3A task force at the request, actually inserted by the selectmen. The advisory committee and the board of selectmen, as it shows on page 61, have voted unanimously in support of this article. The recommended motion is as follows, that the town appropriate an amount not in excess of $195,000 from available reserves for civil engineering services to finalize development of plans and specs for Route 3A Rotary Summer Street Corridor Roadway Improvements and all incidental costs. Is there a discussion on the recommended motion under 37? Seeing none, we come to vote. This requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Article 38. We are now going to get into a series of zoning articles, each which of which requires, or at least some of which require for adoption two-thirds. There may be one that does not, and I will announce it at the time. Article 38 asks, will the town amend the zoning bylaw of Hingham, adopted March 10, 1941, as heretofore amended as follows? Item 1, by amending section Roman no, IC3, by deleting 100 in the second sentence and deleting 100 in the fourth sentence and inserting 300 in both locations. This requires for adoption a two-thirds vote of town meeting, and you will see it relates to uh, penalties and fines, and it's a clarifying amendment which comes to you with the unanimous support of advisory and the planning board. Is there any discussion on this matter? If not, we come to vote. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. 39. 39 asks, will the town amend the zoning bylaw as heretofore amended as follows? By amending section Roman 3A 4.18 to delete, quote, intentionally left blank, end quote, and insert, quote, retail sale of alcoholic beverages to be submitted, to be permitted rather, by special permit A2 in business district A, business district B, and waterfront business and zero, or O rather as in no, in all other zoning districts. The article proposes changes in the ways Hingham bylaw treats package stores that sell alcoholic beverages. The recommended motion of advisory and the planning board or of advisory is on page 62. And I will read it. Let the town amend the zoning bylaw adopted March 10, 1941 by doing the following. Amending section Roman 3A 4.18 to delete intentionally left blank and insert retail sale of alcoholic beverages to be permitted in business district A and business district B to be allowed in special, by special permit A2 in waterfront business districts and prohibited, which is signified by the O, in all other zoning districts. Further, by amending 
3A4.17 to insert 4.18 after 4.16, and other uh, conforming amendments to, de to delete retail and insert retail store, retail sale of alcoholic beverages in Roman 3A4.25, and amending Roman 5A2 to insert store after, quote, retail in the sixth line of the use column in the parking requirements table. Are there questions or discussions of the proposed action under 39? Seeing none, we come to vote. It requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. aye. All opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. Article 40. Article 40 asks, will the town amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Hingham as follows? I'll skip through the uh, text of the article to focus us first on the comment, which I think is helpful. This article seeks to rezone 21 parcels of land owned by the Hingham Conservation Commission from various residential zoning districts to official and open space. The article also proposed to similarly rezone two small landlocked parcels owned by the trustees of reservations on Turkey Hill. During its public hearing, however, the planning board deleted those two parcels from the proposed rezoning at the request of the land owner. This requires for adoption a two-thirds vote of town meeting, the text of the recommended motion of advisory, and planning board, which voted unanimously to support the article, uh, is set forth on page 63. It tracks the text of the article. Is there a discussion? If not, we come to vote. This requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. All in favor, please say aye. Opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote. 41, will the town amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Hingham as previously amended as follows? Again, I'll skip down to the planning board, I strike that, the uh, advisory committee comment, which is on 64, because I think it brings color to an otherwise uh, fairly dense article. The planning board seeks to amend section Roman 3G of the zoning bylaw of the town, which pertains to the downtown Hingham overlay district. The purpose of the downtown Hingham overlay district is to, to protect and promote the viability and the value of business and residential properties located within the district in a manner consistent with Hingham's historic character. The text of the vote is extensive, and it starts at page 65, runs through page 66 in your warrant booklet. Is there anyone from the planning board who wishes to speak to the proposed action under 41, or shall we proceed to a vote? We we'll move to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. It's a unanimous vote on the recommended motion under 41. We move to 42. It's a zoning article requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. It asks, will the town amend the zoning bylaw as heretofore amended by further amending it as follows? This comes to you uh, with the unanimous approval of the advisory committee and the planning board and relates to a number of proposed changes in the permitting process. Is there discussion? Yes, sir. Ooh, sorry. Mike Jones, 65 Pleasant Street. Uh, I just had like some clarification. In reading the, um, the edits to the existing zoning, it mentions that um, you would have to, if you were just contemplating interior work in a, your own home, you would have to go for site plan review and get a minor site plan review or waiver that may be granted. Am I misreading this? Thank you. Mr. Carr for the planning board, or Mr. Ramsey, or Mr. Tondorf Dick. Mr. Ramsey from the Planning Board. Identify yourself, give your address, please. 
Uh, Bill Ramsey, 55 North Street for the Planning Board. Uh, your question pertained to interior work uh, with respect to this article. Interior work uh, is almost always waived by the board. Um, the article really speaks to uh, exterior work. I think in the, years, in the 15 years I've been involved with the board, I think we've uh, never once addressed interior work as over a certain threshold. Yes, sir. You might stay close by, Bill. He has a follow-up. So, I'm sorry. So just to follow up, Mike Jones, 65 Pleasant Street again. Um, if that's the case, um, why is there a site plan review for just interior work? I'm, I'm a little confused. Who would like to address that, Bill? Uh, Bill Ramsey, 55 North Street. A very good question. The interior work would deal with a commercial entity, not a residential. But that's not what it says. Can you draw the uh, attention of the meeting to the particular section you're referring to? Um, let's see. On page 68, in order to um, 5A, upon the written request of the applicant, the planning board may waive any of the submittal requirements, da da da, for its review of the application. And then in B, in order to constitute a minor site plan, the proposed work must be limited to interior renovations to a building or structure that do not include a change of use or parking demand. Mr. Healy, who wishes to address your question. I'm informed by council that uh, site plan review is never triggered by residential projects. Um, I will point out an illustration, though, where site plan review might. Uh, if you look at the library, there's an enclosure around an interior courtyard, uh, which could conceivably speak to site plan review. I remember permitting that, but I, I don't remember the details of it uh, when it was renovated in the past. It's a very limited uh, provision of the bylaw that you're questioning here. And in my 19 years on the board, I never saw it apply to any residential um, project of any kind. So just so I understand, if, if I wanted to do some remodeling work in my home, I would not have to get a waiver from a minor site plan and, interior, and incur that for cost. Sure. For the interior, for sure. You might, you might have other permitting requirements. No, no just interior. Yeah. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that clarification and that question. Are there further questions on the matter before the meeting? If not, we come to vote on the proposed, the recommended rather motion of advisory on 42, requires for adoption a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of the recommended motion under Article 42, please say aye. All those opposed, no. It's unanimous. We'll go to 43. 43 asks, will the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw of the town of Hingham as heretofore amended by replacing the reference to six months, where it appears in the last sentence of section 1C1, or IC1 rather, with 12 months. The article proposes to update the town's Z zoning bylaw to make it consistent with mandatory state law concerning the time in which a permittee may commence a permitted use or construction that has become non-conforming. So this is to conform our local bylaw with state law, and consequently the advisory committee, the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, all voted unanimously in support of this article. The recommended motion is set forth on 71. Is there a discussion? If not, we come to vote. This requires for adoption a two-thirds majority, as it is a zoning matter. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. It's unanimous. 44. 
Zoning board change, a zoning board zoning bylaw rather change, as heretofore amended by replacing the reference to two year period where it appears in the last sentence of section ID2B with a three year period. Again, the article would amend the zoning bylaw by changing the lapse time for a special permit from two years to three. You'll see here a reference to August of 2018 when the Massachusetts legislature modified the maximum lapse period that a municipality may impose in connection with the grant of a special permit, extending it to as much as three years. The town would like to adopt that three-year time frame. Additional time would be appropriate, particularly for more complex projects that require permits from other zoning a regulatory zoning strike zoning regulatory bodies. This comes to us with the unanimous recommendation of planning, zoning, and ADCOM. It requires for adoption a two-thirds vote. Is there discussion? If not, we come to vote on the recommended motion under Article 44. It's set forth at page 71 of your warrant booklet. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. It's unanimous. Article 45. Article 45 asks, will the town authorize but not require the Board of Selectmen to accept grants of easements for streets, water, drainage, sewer, and utility purposes, or any public purpose on terms and conditions the Board deems in the best interest of the town? This is one we see each year. The Advisory Committee and the Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support this article. The recommended motion is set forth at page 71. Is there a discussion? If not, we come to vote on the recommended motion under Article 45, which requires for adoption a simple majority. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those opposed, please say no. That is a, unani a unanimous vote. Uh, at this point, I would request that our outgoing chair of the Board of Selectmen, Paul Healy, make a motion that the 2019 annual town meeting of the town of Hingham be dissolved. I note that this motion is not debatable <laughs> and requires for adoption a nine-tenths. No. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been an honor and a privilege to serve you. Thank you so much. I make a motion that this meeting be adjourned. No, 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 no. He, he's going to have to put that on his talent bank application that he needs. He wants to be on the moderator subcommittee. We're not going to adjourn because then we'd have to come back. We're going to dissolve the 2018-19. Ah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Dissolve it which means it's over. So we have a motion before us to dissolve the 2019 annual town meeting. Is that been seconded? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous.